Lisa Ellinger, I'm the founding editor of The F-Bomb, which is a blog for young feminists that I founded almost five years ago now. Um, and as I was just telling some of my panelists, um, it's kind of incredible to think, I did start that five years ago, and when I did, there was no recognition of the word feminism, at least in my community. People would look at me like I had two heads when I talked about it, um, it had all these horrible stereotypes associated with it, and it's kind of incredible to think about how much that has changed in just a few years. I mean, Beyonce is standing in front of the word feminist now, and Taylor Swift and Nicki Minaj are taking to Twitter fights about feminist ideals, supposedly. Um, <laughs> so, um, that being said, there's, there's also a lot of discussions within the feminist community that there's still plenty of work to be done, um, especially when we talk about diversity, which I hope we'll get into a little bit more in this panel. Um, so I think we're just gonna sort of talk about that tension today. We have come so far. Um, we have so many people advocating for women's education and, and all these other really important issues, but we can't forget the work that we still have to do. Um, but I'm just gonna talk about that. Our amazing panelists are gonna talk about that. I'm gonna introduce each of them now. So we have Renee, who is the Director of Girls and Women Integration at the Clinton Global Initiative, a program with the Clinton Foundation. And at CGI, she is responsible for guiding members in developing gender equality commitments. And prior to CGI, Renee was the Senior Advisor of Impact and Innovation at the Tide Foundation, where she designed the collaborative giving models in gender equity, human rights, and social justice. And I'm sure she'll talk more about that incredible work. We have Jonathan Kalin who is the founder of Party With Consent, a grassroots movement working to help end sexual assault on college and high school campuses, with chapters developing domestically and internationally. He travels the country speaking on the philosophies behind Party With Consent, including, but not limited to, healthy masculinity, media literacy, and movement building. So welcome, Jonathan. And Michelle Sand, is the editor-in-chief of Seventeen, the largest monthly teen media brand, reaching more than 12 million readers each month, she joined the magazine for People in December 2014, where she served as special projects editor. With her experience delivering emotional and entertaining stories, she plans to build on 17th rich history of being the ultimate guidebook for teen girls. And she hopes to fill each issue with advice to help teen girls navigate high school and hormones, friendships and fashion trends, social media and self-esteem, all to fuel the ambition, confidence, and passion of young women. So thank you all for being here today. And Let's just get right into it. Um, how did you guys first encounter feminism? And what's your take on how it has evolved since then? Um, I think um, I first encountered feminism, I mean, first of all, I was a girl, so I kind of started there. Um, <laughs> uh, but then also just through my mom, who's been really strong and has been like a strong role model for me throughout my life, kind of. She's a midwife and, um, and a nurse, a registered nurse, and she's been really the guiding force behind me, just kind of really thinking about who I am and who I want to be still at this age. Um, and so my family's from the Caribbean, and, and we tend to have like a very traditional role in the Caribbean. So it's very much like the man is the man, and then the woman's the woman, we do very distinct gender roles. So when my mom was really strong, my father was always the kind of like, be a girl, be a girl. You know, I liked volleyball, and I liked, you know, doing a lot of stuff that I considered, like, boy things. Um, and my father kind of, like, pushed me away from that, while my mother pushed me towards it. And so I think it started there, and then as the job that I took, and I kept, continued to grow in my career, I realized that even though gender equality was not part of my job description, it always was part of my frame. And then as I grew in my career, I realized that this is just, it just makes sense if we're talking about 51, 52% of the population, that we stop talking about girls and women as kind of like an issue area or another human being as opposed to just thinking about gender equality and then girls and boys and men and women are all the same. And that anything that has to happen in the world that has to have a frame of equality. And so I've just grown from there within my career, just around the gender equality frame. Hi. Um, I, want, I wanted to start really quickly just by saying how humbled I am to be on this panel. Um, I was mentioning it a little bit before, but um, part of the consent the organization that I founded uh, was lucky enough to go to the Clinton Global Initiative University, which is uh, a part of CGI, which uh, Renee is a part of. And, I don't think I would continue to do this if it wasn't for uh, that summit. And Michelle, Party of Consent, was uh, in 17, and the 
August issue this, uh, this past fall, and uh, our Instagram hashtags went up about like 2,000%. <laughs> and Julie, we, we've been on the internet. <laughs> and uh, since then, your friendship and talking with you has always been so awesome and makes me inspired. Um, my, my story is sort of uh, like backwards, I guess. I, I don't think I ever claimed that I'm a feminist. Um, I, it was in my, my own search for my own identity. Uh, as a man, I grew up in a really hyper-masculine setting uh, playing basketball. Uh, I still really love basketball. I've always played it. I was the captain of my team in college. Um, and when I was 12, I went to a basketball camp at Princeton University. And uh, when, when we were driving home, my mom and I, uh, we got home and we didn't see my dad's car. And I just crashed. I fell right to sleep um, because those camps are really tiring. And I woke up in the morning and I still didn't see my dad's car. Um, I did see my aunts and my mom's best friend. Uh, and I walked outside, and my mom had a blanket draped over her. And she'd clearly been up all night. And I saw her back, and then she turned to me, and she said, John, last night, Dad's car hit a skid, and uh, he didn't make it. And so the reason why I bring that up is being 12 years old um, in this really hyper-masculine setting around basketball, uh, this sort of figure of what masculinity is supposed to look like is gone. Uh, and I don't have a very close family uh, outside of that, and so it's just my mom and I. And so when I'm thinking about uh, playing athletics and doing things in school, and people are telling me, you know, be tough, everything that I thought about when it came to toughness uh, came back to my mom. And how much that her emphasis on education, even when I really didn't want to do it, uh, even when I really wanted to stay home sick from school and just cry my eyes out. Um, and you know, this sort of false sense of hyper-masculine uh, toughness that surrounded the guy on the basketball team who uh, could tell stories about objectifying women and uh, making homophobic comments, that always seemed like such weakness to me. Um, and uh, so sort of, in that, I sort of came to it, I went to college, and I helped start a group called Male Athletes Against Violence, and sort of from there, people were sort of saying, hey, did you wear the shirt that says, like, this is what a feminist looks like? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, uh, um, so it sort of just came in a progression, organic progression of life events, and uh, being really lucky to have certain people in my life. I could listen to you talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess um, my sort of introduction to feminism is a little bit, a little bit like yours. So I actually was raised by a single mom. My dad had passed away when I was two, and it was amazing the community of women who helped raise me. It was my mother, it was my aunt, it was my grandmother. It was the community of women around me um, growing up in Syracuse. Um, it was incredible to the point where I had actually no idea where men fit into the home life, my poor brother. I was like, what are you doing here? Um, I was like, yeah, great, you have your opinions. Um, and then my poor husband, I mean, I honestly didn't even know how that worked because, you know, my mother raised two children on her own. She worked all the time. She took my brother to basketball or volleyball. I'm sorry, I was like absorbing your story. <laughs> my, brother, my brother would go to volleyball. I would go to dance class. My mom would watch you know, the basketball tournaments with my brother and then take me to the ballet. Like, it was just, she was this incredible woman who could do it all. And um, so she was a real big role model for me. But then also, the magazine that I work for now was just such a huge influence to me. And this is a story I've said so many times. Tammy, I'm sure, has heard it too. Um, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white suburb, and there weren't that many people who looked a lot like me. There were not that many people who could point out where the Philippines was on a map. Um, so there was a lot of explaining, who are you? Where did your family come from? What language do you speak? You eat what? There was so much of that going on that you, know, you grow up feeling other, even though I'm a woman like you, I'm an American like you, I was born here. So there was a lot of that happening. And I always say there was this one month in 17 
there was just a simple beauty story. It was an Asian girl who got a, a makeover. She went from long black hair to this short, really cool, edgy blob with, the bob, bob, with this red streak in her hair, and I thought it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I ripped it out. I got the exact same haircut without the red streak because my mother and I fought for hours. <laughs> but like just with that simple move, like just with that simple picture, I belonged. I was a part of something bigger. I was not living apart from the rest of the world. And so feminism for me always was about being a strong female, but it was also being inclusive. And 17 was that for me, and it's hopefully what it will be for future generations. And it's really important to make sure all women, um, are, all men, are included in the conversation. So that was sort of my introduction. So just to jump off that point, actually, um, I'm also in the media, and I think we would all agree that media is an incredibly impactful source on young women in a variety of ways. Um, so how do you, as the editor in chief of 17, incorporate those ideas into your mission, and how do you see readers responding to that? Um, well, I will say early on, early on, I'm seven months into the job, but <laughs> all of the letters that I've gotten thus far from readers, you can imagine what the subject matters are. I get everything from, what about body image? What happened to Zayn Malik? Um, <laughs> where did my, where did all my freebies go? Um, and then there are the questions of, I really want a discussion on gender equality, or I, what about gender roles? And these really broad terms keep coming into my inbox, which I think is a huge and fantastic sign that there, you and all of your peers are really wanting to be engaged in this conversation. So my goal is to just make sure each month we try to engage that conversation in different ways. When I look at you know, the wall where we see all of the pages, my very first thing I look for is diversity in terms of um, different skin tones and different life experiences. If I do not see somebody who looks a little bit like me, then I'm like, where did this person go? If I don't see somebody who um, has darker skin tone, if I see a beauty page that only has really light foundation at all times, that's not inclusive and that's not reflection of where we are. Um, so, it, but it's a challenge because I only have, in a print magazine, 10 opportunities a year. I only produce 10 issues a month um, and I only have so many pages to do that. So that's really where our social media um, campaigns come in and also um, all of our different platforms. But really what we're trying to do is just continue a conversation. I never want to put something out there and say this is what you should believe. This is what is right. This is what is good. It is always, this is what's happening, what do you think of it? This is what's happening, how do you engage with this subject? How do you make a difference with that? Um, and that's something that's been really wanting to do is create a platform for you guys to have a conversation or for people to come to the pages of 17, see what's going on, and then take that to their friends, to their peers, to She's the First, and say, hey, I saw this in the magazine, what do you think of it? And continue the conversation beyond the pages. So media is a sort of feminist issue that we talk a lot, a lot about in the Western world. And I'm wondering, Renee, um, if you could put feminism into a global context for us um, through the work that you've done. Um, what are some of the really crucial issues in other countries? And how does that compare to this Western idea of feminism? Well, um, I think, first of all, it's important to understand, I'm sure many of you already recognize, that the idea of feminism is actually a privilege that we have in America. Uh, around the world, human rights are like the basic, you know, go-to, um, and girls don't even have the right to decide when and if they're going to marry, if they're going to have children, whether or not to go to school. The answer is probably they will not be able to go to school. Um, all their rights are, or most of their rights are challenged, um, and so the idea of the feminist model globally is not one that will necessarily work. Um, what we do think about at the Clinton Global Initiative and what I thought about throughout my work is what does really work? What's the conversation that we need to have? And it's really, again, about human rights and what everyone is born with and what everyone's entitled to. And so the conversations that are being ha happening globally need to be reinforced here domestically um, in support of folks like um, Malala and also other girls who cannot go to school in India and in Bangladesh and, and the girls in Nigeria. It's just, I think it's a broader context. I don't want to get too heavy, 
But I think it's important that we understand that just that us having this conversation right now is an absolute privilege. They can't even walk down the street, many girls, and talk about a boyfriend or um, or just talk about Seventeen magazine or have a copy of it. And it's like contraband. Um, and so the <laughs> thoughts, the things that we can do, I think, to help support girls in other countries that are going through this are, of course, social media. But again, there's social media bans, right? So. What you have here with Twitter and Facebook and all of this being able to be outspoken and leading in and all of this stuff is not something that they, they have. But we have to be their voice outside of their country. And we have to be the voice to our government to push to their government to make sure that they're doing the right thing. And so anything that we can hashtag or tweet or talk about or just kind of give a shine to, just like, and I'm not gonna, don't wanna jump ahead of what you're gonna talk about, but. Um, also, like pushing our celebrities to kind of be in the forefront, and many of them are doing that, which is amazing. But just understanding how just the fact that you're sitting here, a girl somewhere else would not be able to do. They can't go anywhere without a brother or an uncle or a father. There are girls that I've spoken to who have been abused by, since the age of three, and then were taking away from their homes to live somewhere else because them being at home, other people will try to kill them as a righteous killing because of their, the abuse that they suffered brought shame on their family. So, I think I'm talking to much. <laughs> <laughs> so, the abuse that they suffered was gonna bring shame on their family. And so these three-year-old, four-year-old, six-year-old girls had to be removed from their home in order to save their lives and then they don't see their families again. So again, not to bring anyone down, but just understanding where you are and being you know, really empowered to do what you do for yourself and then for others. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think it's undeniable that globally women face disproportionate disadvantages, but given that, I'm gonna direct this to Jonathan, but I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on this. So what is the role of men in feminism? And do you think men can and should call themselves feminists? Yeah, um, so I'm going to answer the first one and see how I come to the semantic idea around feminism or are men supposed to be pro-feminists or what. Um, the, so for, for me, like, as men, uh, it's never, it's never <laughs> my role uh, to define women's experiences for them. Um, and I think that sometimes in my work and speaking on campus and talking with other men, it's sort of like, uh, you know, we want to we want to be good guys. We want to do the right thing, and we want to show all this stuff um, and you know show ways that women are being oppressed in these different in different forms, even on campus. And um, it, it's it's for me, it's always been presenting information, um, but then allowing a conversation. So I've sat at many conversations, one of which is uh, at home when, with my mom basically every night who uh, debates me a lot about certain ideas of feminism. Uh, just listening, listening to where people are coming from, what their background, are, what, what their background is. So I think uh, men and all of the energy around getting men's voices involved in it, it should never come as a sort of, okay, now we as men can tell women what they're experiencing. We can, we can say these are the statistics, this is what's happening, what, this is what's happening. Um, but, um, so I, you know, I feel like I would be, it would be silly for me on this panel to be talking about um, gender equality and how it exists right now um, as, as a man on a, on a panel with uh, three amazing women. Um, but with that said, uh, the, it's, it's basically inferred, it's pretty, it's pretty well known that gender is homosocial. So um, when you hear be a man from a man, it carries more weight than if you hear be a man from a woman. Um, and we sort of, as men, we learn this uh, collectively from each other. So um, I can recognize how frustrating that is, uh, particularly around issues of anti-violence when you're sort of, uh, as, we're, we're sort of trying to get this message out, and oftentimes it's women. That, you know, the party of consent chapters are very often led by women, and they're asking, you know, how do we get men involved? Um, and it's really these male-to-male -male conversations um, that are important. Uh, so, with that in mind, 
I see men's role as really engaging the conversation with their with their peers, the the, the men that they play sports with, the men that uh, they find themselves in the same locker room as, the men in their lives, um, and really engage with the fact that like I I too as a man have a gender, um, which a lot of guys, you know, when when I say certain things like you know men. Uh, what do you do before a night out to protect yourself from potentially being sexually assaulted uh, on your campus? Like the room just goes totally blank, um, and that's that's not to say that men aren't assaulted, but it adds to the taboo around uh, what what men are allowed to be thinking about in, in regard to it. So, um, yeah, really the conversations around engaging internally rather than saying women, it, even in a patriarchal sense, right, like women are helpless and we need feminism and we need men and feminism to help them, but rather internally say, what is it about my own identity, what are the actions that I take as a man uh, that allow this to continue um, and turn that conversation internally. So uh, that, still, that still leaves me at, um, I'm not totally sure what men are allowed to call themselves in the movement. Um, but I would say more, most importantly is just to stick around, not, not really worry about uh, the, the title that you get, um, but just be conscious listening and recognize that as a man you have a gender um, and don't step on the toes of people uh, speaking from their genuine experiences. First of all, the fact that you're even on this panel is such a huge <laughs> difference from when I would discuss feminism um, as a teenager and everything. So applause to you and applause to everybody who's really coming together for this conversation. Because it, what I really love about it is that I feel lately the conversation is about people as a whole. I think mean, everybody benefits from feminism. You don't have to be a man, or you don't just have to be a female, you can be a man and benefit from feminism, you can be white and benefit from feminism, you can be Asian and benefit from feminism. I think the movement itself, well, yes, has the word feminism in it, um, is really all-encompassing. And um, even just looking in the room now, like everybody here is benefiting from what the work and what you believe in and what facet of feminism you want to work towards or work for. Um, I think that's probably the, the most exciting thing about the movement right now, is that it doesn't feel like it's just for women, it feels like it's for everybody, and I mean everybody in the US, everybody globally, um, we all sort of benefit from banding together in that sense. So that's probably the most exciting transition, it feels like, um, even when you see Lean In Together, even when you see Heat for She, even when you see men in pink shirts saying she's the first, everything here. Um, works and makes me feel really excited about sort of the future of the movement and where it's moving. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Definitely, I will call you a <laughs> Um And I think that we have to take this thing out of the word, you know, and there's, there's been like three waves of feminism, right? So we started with the suffrage movement and then we started with, then we had the second wave with Gloria Steinem and all of that and, you know, sexual rights. And then now we have the third wave that, seems to be more inclusive. And so we're talking about LGBTQ rights and we're talking about women of color more and we're talking about poverty more and immigration. So I think that we need to take this thing and the buzz out of feminism and make it more of a larger concept around you know, just women doing really great things for women and men doing really great things for men and men doing great things for women and women doing great things for men in a way that it's just like everybody is, I, I know I think Beyonce used the word, um, the term humanist, um, which I get where she was coming from with that, but um, I think we do still have to make sure we have this gender equality lens. So I'm glad you focused on that and talked about gender um, and moving away from the girl and the boy and the man and the woman towards a more um, kind of, it's, we're all in it together and how do we make sure that we're working, again, with equality in mind, and that we're inclusive of those who may be of lower income statuses that need to be included in these conversations? Because to be quite honest, many times this conversation has been about white mainstream women. Okay, I'm just gonna put it out there, I'm just gonna say it. 
Um, and so now as we move towards a more global conversation and we move towards a more inclusive society, we need to start talking more about people of color, women of color. We need to start talking about transgender community, the lesbian community. We need to start talking about immigration. What does it look like for girls and women to stand up for rights for immigrants? Like, let's talk about that. Let's also talk about what it looks like to talk about race. You know, how does the feminist movement actually have a hand in what's going on racially when a lot of low-income women and a lot of the women of color are actually part of the abuses and of the human rights violations that are going on right here in the United States. So just taking it a little broader, again, because that's just what I do, just let's just start thinking, having a larger conversation about that. So I I wasn't I didn't find the right time to like actually show it, but so this like this is what our tank top looks like. So clearly like a lot of sensationalism and not a ton of depth, right? Like neon neon font on uh, a tank top, right? Um, and so uh, what what made I think what made party with consent work was that it uh, had sort of the deeper conversation going with the group Male Athletes Against Violence that uh, helped start. Um, and so I think that's where pointing to the role of celebrity feminism, pointing to the role of uh, you know, celebrities taking this on in the media, uh, is that I think it can certainly start a conversation. So I think I would be wrong to say that the more people who wear party with consent t-shirt, like, the more that the whole entire problem is being solved. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the more people who are wearing this sensationalized neon impact font t-shirt or tank top uh, starts that many conversations um, and is the beginning of a conversation. Uh, and I think it works in the same way with, um, with the conversations that can get started on social media or can get started with uh, celebrities starting the conversation is uh, do celebrities hold the answer to everything in feminism? Again, same as a party with consent tank top. Uh, no, but uh, do they play a role in starting the conversation? Definitely. Um, and dealing with some of the people uh, that I've dealt with, I want to latch on to anything. Uh, and talking about being on college basketball teams or talking to, not, not to stereotype, but uh, talking to certain fraternities. And uh, I, just, I just want anything that can, sit, can, can be a sort of place to, like, where, where can we start? Um, and so I think as long as it's known as like, this is where we start, um, let the people who are working on this actively uh, continue the conversation uh, afterwards is what I think is important about that. Um, clearly I have a lot of celebrities in my work life. Um, and I, I agree, I think as long as, I, I honestly, Beyonce standing in front of the word, all of that, think of all the pictures that then circulated on social media. Think about how that conversation is started. I think what's important is what you keep stressing, what's Renee keeps stressing, it's a conversation. Just because Taylor Swift says it doesn't necessarily mean it's law, because sometimes I, I mean, I'm a Swifty, like I'll follow what she says, <laughs> but it's not a law. It's a conversation starter. And what needs to happen is you see Beyonce do that, you see Taylor Swift say that, you see somebody say, no, I'm not a feminist. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for your community? Take that, what they're doing, and enhance that conversation and move it beyond there. I love that they're bringing attention to the word. I love that they're bringing attention to the movement. I love that they're stirring even a conversation here in this room. That says something, but we can't let them lead the charge, per se. We all, we all have to have an impact on that and really further the conversation and make sure, you know, we're not always taking our social cues from celebrities. That, um, but I, I have to applaud them. If they're gonna use their platform, like Emma Watson's using her platform, bravo. And she's starting a conversation again. Like she is opening up your mind to thinking about feminism as inclusive and really helping to start this sort of engagement in that sense. So um, 
I applaud them. There are times I want to just strangle them for what they do and how that affects my work life. Um, but the moments where they do bring up this conversation, in the moments where I get to put on my cover, I'm proud to be a female, it's all about confidence, and our readers really engage and really react to that and are really drawn to that, I have to say I'm thankful for them sometimes. So I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> a final question for all of you, then I think we're going to go to audience questions. Um, and you've all certainly touched on this, but just to narrow in a little bit more. So what do you think are the biggest weaknesses in this movement? Um, and where can feminism improve from this point forward? Yeah, I, um, I think I touched on that before. <laughs> um, but I definitely think in um, terms of inclusion and just making sure that all the voices that we need are heard um, and that we're having the larger conversations even if they're sparked by celebrities um, just being able to then say now what does that mean and having larger group conversations about feminism i think there was this um this i was at a panel one time and i was actually in the audience and this ceo from a company and i can't remember his name once said that um when it comes to men and women and promotion and leadership in life, like men get promoted because of their potential, right? So they're seen as these great people for president or just in life or for the basketball team or whatever based on their potential. While women have to live their lives based on merit, right? So we're always having to prove that we're the right person to take that next step. That we're all, we always have to go that extra mile and say that we've already done it in order for someone to say to us, oh, you can do this. Whereas a man can just, you know, right or wrong, can say, you know, they say, oh, he looks like he can do it. He has the right education. He should just be able to do that. So I think that um, where we need to also start moving is to a place where I don't want to take that away from men. I think that's great. Everybody should be about, you know, about what your potential is. How do we get to a place where women are also promoted and viewed and given responsibilities based on their potential because there's limited potential um limitless potential in girls and women and how do we make sure that we're actually capturing that and then how do we make sure that we're included in conversations around poverty around immigration and around race that's where i think that we need to step up um, in the feminist movement and also around um, the lgbtq community like how do we make sure that we're part of those conversations Uh, yeah, along, along the similar lines, um, in my, my experience like working with cap, campus chapters also is, is this idea of, of uh, how, how do you combine unity and individualism? So like, I'm really inspired by all the faces here, all donning the same shirt, um, because you all come here as individuals from your individual campus, but you come under a greater umbrella of She's the First, um, and you get ice cream together apparently and have some of the parties while you're here, so, uh, you're, so, you're, so you're connecting uh, on a higher level while still recognizing um, there's a connection between, oh, she's the first X college, or she, she's the first Y college. We do it this way, you do it that way, but we're both well, she's the first. I think the same thing sort of happens um, with feminism and we're sort of pushing on a human tendency to say, uh, if I define myself this way, uh, other people who define themselves this way have to be very similar to me. So. Um, I got the, the green light to call myself feminist from this panel. Um, and my girlfriend, who's in the back of the room taking a photo, uh, she, she, she also defines herself as a feminist. feminist. Um, and, uh, but I do some things sometimes that she thinks is ridiculous. Um, and sometimes she does things that I think are ridiculous, like falling asleep when we're watching a really intense basketball game. Actually, actually that's usually me. Um, but uh, but the, all, all in the same, uh, it works the same on college campuses, right? It's like there's some campuses that we go to that have no Greek life. And so how do you sort of say like, oh, like you should connect with this campus that is a huge state school. Um, and so sort of, I'm like, you have the conference call and everybody's sort of like, wait a minute, like what, what are we actually? So um, that's the sort of challenge that I see uh, in, in feminism, especially as we uh, work to build inclusivity is um, how, how do we internally push on this idea that um, just because we define ourselves some way and somebody else decides and, and wants to define themselves that way that they, they can do that in a way that's different from us. Um, so for, for me to define myself as feminist, a feminist and then I see another man do it, 
um, in a way that I think you know that's that's wrong again conversation um, and uh, not for me to sort of exclude or push away but for me to push internally and say this is a natural this is a natural human tendency to think that this person is claiming rights to something that they don't deserve um, but it would be more conscious of me to uh, have a conversation with them and learn where they're coming from. Um, I guess I'm still always a little shocked about sort of the ick or the fear factor with the word feminism and the word feminist. That still is such a, I, I feel, is such a weakness um, within the movement because it's, it's a word, <laughs> but it, it means so much. I mean, I think even just talking about equal pay, like women are 78 cents, but we just want 22 cents. Just give us the 22 cents that you give a man. Like I paid four dollars for a coffee, like we can find the 22 cents <laughs> to get the equal pay for the dollar. Um, but when you look at it in that sense though, what, what that feminist sort of push and that feminist goal is, is equality. There's nothing dirty about that word. There's nothing icky about being equal. There's nothing horrible or something there's nothing to be turned off about this idea of equality. It just so happened that the trappings were females were the ones who were at the disadvantage, so feminism became the word for it. But when you look at it, you take the step back, feminism's about equality. That's all it is. There's nothing wrong with feminism, there's nothing wrong with the word of that, because really, it's just, it should actually be in the thesaurus as like another word for equality at this point. It is just another word for it. So I just don't understand, and obviously I get very riled up, when this idea of I'm not one or the word, or I just don't like the word, you can't say that. Feminism itself is really about bringing people onto the same level, giving people the same opportunities. And it just so happens that this focus ha started with women, but when you think about it, Think about what the advantages that men have as a society as a whole get when we're all on an equal playing field. It's a very simple, and yet for some reason it has been tangled up in a lot of different emotions and a lot of different politics that we just sort of need to clear out. And when you look at it on a very simple level, the word feminism is good, the word feminist is good, and it's the goal of it for equality is fantastic. I just want to touch on one thing that both, both of you said, which I think is great. Um, and it's about just us being inclusive of whatever anyone else wants to see as feminism, right? Or as a feminist. I think that's really important. Because as people, we tend to get judgy, especially when we're looking at celebrities. And, and then, you know, you have these debates about the moms or the not the moms and like, what does feminism look like? I should be able to work. No, I should be able to stay home. Um, and I think it's really about the equality of the word and the equality around I should be able to do. Feminism for me means I should be able to do and express myself however I want to and be whoever I want to be without having to be judged by anyone else as long as I'm not hurting anyone else. And I think that's kind of um, where I just want to leave it because I thought you two like grazed on those points. I think it's just really important to hit home that you don't, feminism, we don't judge.
So the question, how can we change the conversation to move feminists into a more positive view? Uh, for me, that's, that's all about relationship. Um, I think that, the, as Michelle mentioned, the, the ick factor uh, exists in ways that are not uh, rational, but at times humans aren't rational. And so, uh, you know, coming to coming to conversations with people um, that you just you just want to get so mad with them, um, and and coming to them, and especially with people that you really care about, whether it's people in your family or uh, friends of yours. I know it happens a lot with me uh, playing basketball growing up. Um, but uh, the way that the way that I tried to uh, develop in a more positive view is to is, is was sort of about the way I live my life, um, and then and then all of a sudden I just say you know and I'm a feminist. So the um, actions that I took on uh, inspired people to vote for me to be the captain of my basketball team uh, for two years, and then with that came some respect, uh, and with that came uh, a more positive view. That was my experience. So. Relationships. Uh, I guess I'll take the first one um, about the experiences between feminism of white women and those of women of color in conversation. Um, I think first we have to rip the band aid off and be willing to have the conversation. So, having rooms where we can talk about this and, and having even if it's like social media gatherings where we can talk about the differences and being open about those differences and how we move forward. So I think that's the only way that the feminist movement in general is gonna move forward is if we start tackling the issues among women um, of color and white women in this conversation. So first, just start it, start it with your friends, right? Just start talking about it. And now we're in an age of everyone's friends with everyone else, whether it's real or virtual. Everyone has different friends. <laughs> So start that conversation. And then also I would invite you to bring women and girls in globally into those conversations. Because I think it also puts into perspective the conversations we're having about race in America. When you're talking about globally women who they're all the same, there might be class differences, but they all may look very similar. I and mean, what the issues they are having around feminism. And I think it helps to put into context the, the small things that we are leaving out in our country because we are not talking about women of color and having the race conversation. When you start thinking globally, you know, America's really, really small. Um, and then so if we really want to move forward, we have to get beyond this conversation of race in a good way. The one about, we talk, we talk about starting a conversation about feminism, what kind of tangible results would you like to see? Um, Wait before I race down here, the front page of the New York Times has an article about how millennial dads are not the dads that they want to be. And the article in and of itself actually touches on paternity leave and how there is none for them. And so it's expected that the mom takes all of this time off to raise his child and the dad only gets you know one or two weeks and has to go back to work and leaves mom alone, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a tangible result because personally, Nothing would make me happier than if my husband would be able to come home and be with me if we were to have a family and have equal paternity leave without just thinking it's on me to take care of a newborn for the first three months of its life. So I think the tangible, and that in and of itself, that article, it's about millennial dads, that's about feminism. That is about having an equal playing field again so that way parents, it's not just about dads either, it's just parents in general being able to be home at equal time and investing the time in family and in work. Um, so that to me, coming here was a really exciting sign. It's a really exciting sign of the conversations that have been happening and where we are moving forward because again, I just think the advantages that we get when everybody sort of gets an equal playing field and to be who they want to do to invest the time in what they want to invest the time in, um, I just think the results are going to be incredible. So, I mean, it's the front page of the New York Times. So that gave me hope, and it was a nice tangible result in that idea that, um, you know, everybody should play an equal role at home and also get equal rights in the workplace, even if it is about paternity or maternity leave or just parental leave in general. Okay. Um, yeah, to... Uh, go off of what Michelle was saying, how, how do you all define feminism? Um, we touched on it a little bit, um, but definitely, um, you know, uh, equality, 
uh, between men and women, that's the simplest way to put it. Um, but then how, how do you get to that equality? I think uh, really stems from a mindset. So, um, you know, the fact that the word feminism isn't in a New York Times article about millennial dads not being who they want to be uh, doesn't make it not about feminism. So uh, the idea that when we go into decisions, uh, are we thinking about um, sustainability? Are we thinking about is it healthy? Um, uh, you know, a lot of people say, there's, there's groups of people who say, um, feminism is anti-male, and um, the truth is, is one of my greatest mentors, Jackson Katz, who's a leader of uh, a group called Mentors in Violence Prevention, uh, he brought to my attention that uh, feminists basically started the men's health movement. Um, you're gonna have to ask him how it happened, I don't, I don't remember all the details, but, um, so with that in mind, it, it sort of stems back to um, it, being about equality, but it being about a mindset of how we get to that equality and the questions that we ask ourselves when we're making important decisions, and especially when we're making important decisions that are going to affect others. Okay, I'm going to tackle the one about intersectionality um, and how you fight that when all the odds are against you or seemingly against you. Um, I think first, not to sound old woo woo, but it's you know changing kind of the mindset. Of, okay, all the odds are against me, and I am. I have all these other things that are playing. Like I'm a woman, I'm a person of color, I'm low income, um, and embracing the, that and what that voice then brings to the world. And again, you guys have this amazing like social media stuff out there that you can tap into, and there are people I guarantee you like you who are thinking exactly the same thing. So tapping into those folks and, um, and sharing your story, also very helpful. You know, whether or not you keep a personal journal or you keep a journal online, just sharing that and sharing that with someone that you feel comfortable with. If it's not your mom or your aunt, maybe it's an older friend, because sometimes people in your own peer group, and for me included, don't always have the right answers. But maybe stepping outside your peer group um, a little bit to try and find out who, who knows something and then find those groups that we can talk about it. And I think that the more that you look for those groups and they're out there, then the more, um, the more not alone you feel, the more included you feel, and then that way you also can have larger conversations. And to tie into that, um, there was a question about books that we read or are reading. Um, and so one book that really helped me to grapple with this idea of being a woman of color and being a feminist, um, and what that all entails with all of the different um, racial stuff that's been around the movement, the feminist movement, is a book called um, All the Women Are White and All the Blacks Are Men. And so it's really a great book that because sometimes being a woman of color, you're left out of the racial violence conversation because they're, they're mostly talking about men and boys there. And you're left out of the feminist conversation because oftentimes, um, and now more so, it's not like this, but they have been talking about um, white women. So that book kind of also helped me to figure out where do I fit in with this conversation? Am I black power first, or am I feminist first, or am I Caribbean power first? Like what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And so I thought that helped me. So also looking for books that you can really identify with, um, I think would also be helpful. Yeah, and to connect with that, so I mean, I'm a white, heterosexual man, so uh, in America, I benefit from just about every form of identity privilege. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to uh, you know, lead a conscious effort around uh, sexual violence prevention uh, if it were not for women and women of color saying like, you need to listen to me right now because what you said is just so insensitive. Um, and I'm not saying that that's easy. I know it was not easy for them because I was, I was very, very stubborn. Um, but uh, that continued to happen, um, and that's what I feel led to. We would uh, talk about privilege. The best definition that I've heard of it is the uh, luxury of remaining oblivious. And so um, I definitely was oblivious, and, and still certainly am oblivious to things I can't. I can't see what I can't see, um, but I can work to become more aware of it. And, and that comes from uh, really. Uh, strong and brave people uh, sharing sharing their stories of their experience and explaining to me why what I just said is uh, insensitive. Okay, uh, I define I define my 11-year-old brother as a feminist, but his friends harass him about it. 
he gets discouraged. How can I encourage him to stick around? Um, no, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's a good one. Oh, I, think it, I think it connects a lot with uh, what, what both of you are saying. Is that the, the Scandinavian countries uh, do a really great job with gender, uh, gender equality. Um, and, and what they find is that like, happiness of men is, is higher there. Um, and so with that, with, with your 11-year-old brother, like, you know, similar experiences for me. I, I can't say that being the captain of the basketball team who decided to say, I'm going to uh, make all the athletes on my campus aware that rape happens here, uh, led to like the cheeriest college experience. Uh, but it certainly made it meaningful. Uh, and that, uh, that what, what came with that was um, an opportunity for me to realize that this social harassment that I received, the amount of times where I forgot to log out of my Facebook uh, on the library computer and somebody wrote something awful about party with consent, uh, it's more than I want to remember. Um, and the times where people were partying with and then they drew an out without consent shirts um, happened uh, a bunch of times. And what, what I really realized is that like the people who connect with each other by harassing me for just saying, like, this is the truth, like, I'm, I'm not making any of this up. Um, you can look at the numbers yourself and then you can look at the fact how underreported this is on college campuses. Um, I know, I know, I'm not sure how much I would listen to my uh, sister if I was 11 years old and she told me like, trust me, like at some point, like all these people come, I, I feel like it's the oldest thing to say, but um, the, re the reality is, uh, I think one of them up here is a woman box and uh, what, I, what I do in my work a lot is I try to define a man box. And the reality that liberation does not come at being the pinnacle man. Liberation comes at realizing that there's a social construction of masculinity that, uh, that when you don't abide by it and then you are embarrassed or harassed by your friends, you realize, well, this actually doesn't matter because I'm being the person that I'd like to be, not the expectations of others. So uh, it's definitely not to say that uh, it's easy um, or it's going to be fun, um, but the end of it is going to allow a form of liberation that you would not have if you found yourself overly concerned with uh, the harassment of your peers. to um, build up on what you're saying about breaking the box, and it's, it's exactly what you said, just you can break out of the box, um, women are put in well also respect each other. Just be you. You do you. That's what I like to tell everybody, that's what I like to tell all of our readers, that's what I like to tell anybody. I mean, people are going to try and put you in a box. And I think actually our special projects editor um, at 17 once said, you know, people are not going to like everything I say, but that's really their problem. You have every right to be who you are. People are going to try and put you in a box to try to figure you out, try to just at least get a grasp on who you are. Don't let them influence you. You are the best version of yourself. Be the best version of yourself. Put it out there. If you happen to fit in somebody's box, that's convenient. But most of the time, it doesn't work that way. It really sincerely does not. When you thought of a panel about talking about feminism, I'm sure you had a vision in your mind of what that would look like. The four of us are up here. Did we fit in that vision? Did we fit in that box? Do we fit in the box of what feminist is for most people? Maybe not. What's really important is that you really do break out of that box by just being yourself, by voicing who you are, and being really proud of that. We're all trying so hard sometimes to not conform, but just be polite. Just make sure everybody's okay. Everybody will be better if we really do have these honest conversations. You're not going to insult anybody. You're not going to offend it. You might offend somebody. But <laughs> what has to be part of that conversation is that is a possibility. But you have to work past that. I think it's just part of how we can move this forward is just be very honest and have these conversations. You will break down every box humanly possible if we are just allowing ourselves to be ourselves, to state how we feel, and to also just be open to the feelings of others, and then hopefully just have that discussion to move everything forward. I just wanted to answer one more question on um, the negative connotations of the word feminism, and how do you um, have that discussion? Just don't use the word, right? I mean, I think it's okay, because it's not about the word, it's about the action. 
So if you can just talk to people about what equality looks like, or just ask them questions about what's going on in their life and what they think about girls doing this and boys doing that, and then just having a larger conversation. If they cringe at the word, don't use the word. And later on, you might, you know, a year later say, you know you're a feminist, right? But then, you know, then it's too late, and they can't deny it. <laughs> and I think the theme that I'll wrap is like, let's have these conversations, and I think that's the perfect time. So thank you guys so much.